morning. Welcome to Great Cities Institute. Very pleased that you all are here joining us. Uh, Vanessa Cordova, Director of Great Cities Institute, Professor of Urban Planning and Policy. I want to welcome you and I want to begin by introducing Mr. Henry Henderson, who is the Midwest Director of the National Resource Defense Council. Well, thank you. I'm really uh, happy to be here. Uh, it's a return. I used to be a fellow at the Great Cities Institute a number of years ago uh, doing uh, research on urban environments and what it meant for uh, the future of our, of, our, of our culture and how cities actually are at the heart of um, our reality of the transformation of the environment. Um, I'm really pleased to be talking about this issue about climate and its impact on cities, but particularly its impact on uh, environmental justice. I think that uh, one of the things we're living with, and particularly in Chicago, is the fact that we have a built environment that was constructed for a very different climate reality. Uh, it was constructed for a different time of how we uh, use energy, how uh, weather and uh, heat and cold affect us. Uh, and in Chicago, the issue of the change in climate is not an abstract issue. Um, there was a time, I, I was commissioned in environment for a number of years in the city of Chicago, and at a time when there was a massive heat wave. There's a wonderful book called Heat Wave, The Anatomy of the Autopsy of a uh, Social Disaster. And it has to do with a very large period of incredible heat in the city of Chicago where hundreds and hundreds of people die from the heat. Why is that? It's because our, our social structure and our building structures were not built in order to support um, the realities of that heat. It's a time when uh, we uh, live very differently where the ability to be outside was different, and instead what we had was um, people being afraid to go outside, being afraid to keep their windows and doors open, uh, isolated from uh, <coughs> their community, and basically cooking inside their homes, literally, and dying from it. This is not an abstract issue about changing climate regimes. It affects us, but it particularly has an effect on uh, on parts of our community where people are deeply underserved and where the burdens of the economy um, are focused on parts of our city and parts of our, our uh, ethnic diversity in the city and the benefits go elsewhere. There's a mismatch of benefit and burden and it's what we have to address. A lot of the problem we're facing today that needs to address climate seem to be abstract. They seem to be at uh, 40,000 feet, as opposed to how it affects people in particular neighborhoods, particular ability to earn a living, and particular ability to survive in a, a deeply changing climate. Um, we have solutions to this, but we don't have the systems to deliver the solutions. And they aren't going to happen unless we have a deeply engaged um, uh, understanding about where the burdens fall, where the risk is, and this is part of this discourse. Um, I'm really happy it's happening here, and it's happening at Great Cities Institute, and I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about uh, what is being done in addressing this uh, significant issue. So, thank you very much. Thank you. And what we know from the research of Voces Verdes is Latinos care very much about global climate change. Much has been said about the growing importance of the Latino population, which currently stands at 17% of the U.S. population. The population currently at 53 million is expected to double by 2030. Latinos account for 56% of the nation's population growth between 2000 and 2010. In 2012, 12 million Latinos voted in the presidential election 10% of the U.S. electorate, and this number is expected to double to 20% by 2030. Here in Illinois, Latinos represent 16% of our state's population. Our panelists today are experts in the field of environment, environmental justice, and environmental health. 
The Great Cities Institute brought them together here today in conjunction with Los Verdes to lead us into a very timely discussion, specifically as the political and policy debates around climate change pick up speed it is imperative that we talk about the issues of environmental and climate justice and reach a better understanding of how Latinos and other communities are disproportionately affected by increasing extreme weather events. Having made mention of the heat wave a few years back, we know that the impact of these devastating extreme events um, can be very severe. With us today is Dr. Manuel Castor, Dr. Pastor is a professor of sociology and American studies and ethnicity at the University of Southern California, where he currently directs the program for environmental and regional equity. His research focuses on issues of environmental justice, regional inclusion, and the economic and social conditions facing low-income urban communities. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Welcome. Also joining us is Rafael Otado. Mr. Otado works as a community organizer for the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. And we have folks here from, uh, from the organization located on the southwest side of Chicago. Within uh, Alvejo, he has worked on several campaigns such as Open Space, a campaign which was successful in the remediation of the Superfund site which is currently be being converted into the first new park Little Village has seen in over 80 years. Also worked on a clean power campaign, which was successful in the shutdown of both the Crawford and Fisk coal power plant. Welcome, Rafael. Another of our guests today, Dr. Morello Frosch, is Professor of Environmental Science, Policy and Management in the School of Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research focuses on environmental health and environmental justice. She is particularly interested in addressing the double jeopardy faced by communities of color and the poor who experience high exposure to environmental hazards and who are more vulnerable to the toxic effects of pollution due to poverty, malnutrition, discrimination, and underlying health conditions. She holds a PhD of environmental science policy and management. Uh, welcome, Rachel. And finally, joining us is Adriana Quintero. Adriana is the founder and director of the National, excuse me, Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, Latino Advocacy Program, and a senior attorney. Adriana launched NRDC's Latino Outreach along with the website La Onda Verde or Love. Most recently, Adriana founded Bosos Verdes and aims to connect Latino organizations, business and community leaders with government decision makers on climate and clean air issues. Welcome, Aliana, and all of you. Aliana, let me start with you. Your organization recently conducted a poll that found that Latino concern for climate change is extremely high. Can you tell us more about the findings of your research? Absolutely. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for the introduction. Um, we know as uh, Latinos that there's a lot of both cultural and just historical resonance for the environment, but what is often missing from the national dialogue um, is that picture of a Latino environmentalist. Beyond, um, in the, especially if you're talking about Washington leadership, uh, there is an assumption that uh, Latinos are too worried about immigration and jobs and the economy to really care about what's happening. We all know, and especially many of you here know, that that is an absolute myth. And what we had seen through the years is that uh, the research was showing that this, in fact, was not true. That Latinos consistently were out there supporting everything from park bonds to water bonds to climate change initiatives. And our goal was to find out a little bit more, figure out exactly how deep this concern ran and how we could amplify that to show that. And when we conducted our most recent research, the evidence bore out. Uh, but nine out of 10 Latinos supported taking action to fight uh, climate change. Uh, and what did we define as that? We talked to people uh, in both focus groups 
and in, in our polling. And what we found was that whether you're talking about it as global warming, um, as climate change, as uh, impacts to our planet due to carbon pollution, the results were the same. Latinos supported and wanted government action to fight this. Now, we wanted to go a little bit deeper into the why, and that's not reflected on the slide. On the slide. We did a lot of focus grouping, we did a lot of talking to folks, and what we found was Latinos, whether we arrived here uh, one generation ago or five generations or more, and, and it doesn't matter if we were, we were born here or otherwise, there is still a strong and deep connection to the environment. In addition to that, there's an aspiration and a very firm belief that we can do better and that our government owes us the ability to do better. So there's a tremendous amount of support, as you'll see, for energy efficient homes and buildings, 92% support for better automobile um, gas mileage. Of course, that's an economic interest, but also a health interest. All of this revolved and all of this was very closely tied to wanting to leave a better future for our children and grandchildren. And, um, and again, that belief that we can do better. So what that tells us is our community has a tremendous amount of potential. Yes, we've been hit in disproportionate amounts by pollution and that's why we're so excited to be here with uh, Dr. Spastor and Morella Frosch and with Rafael who can talk about specifically those impacts. But even beyond that, even for people who felt that they had not been impacted, these results bore out. The interest that we can do better, that we want to do better. That we don't need to live in the past with, where pollution rules, where we can actually move and fall forward. We want to be part of the Green Revolution. We want to be part of the clean energy, renewable economy. And, um, and this shows that we can do it. So our job now is to take all this information and see how we can work with people around the country to make sure that decision makers at the state level and at the national level know this and are prepared to recognize that Latinos care about more than simply immigration issues. That we care about this and we are ready to be out there supporting this. Especially that number up there, people who would be more supportive of a member of Congress, 78%. That is a very high number. So if we can start to tell our decision makers that this is an issue that we want to hear more about, they can show leadership for us, for our communities about, that's where we want to be. And um, that's why we're here today. So hopefully we'll have a, a you know, I would like to talk a little bit more about this as we go along, but um, that's some of our, our well, that's that's pretty that's pretty interesting, and it's, the the point is very clear that there is overwhelming support and interest on the part of Latinos around issues of the environment and, and climate change. But it's also very clear that as a growing presence and political force, that government officials are going to need to really start paying attention to what those issues are in the Latino community. I think that's part of the message that that you're hearing, and I think it's a really important one to to convey and to hear. But it doesn't surprise you, Governor. Uh, no, that's probably just because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, the other thing, uh, you know, thanks for that uh, question. You'll tell that uh, I just happen to have a PowerPoint that might illustrate something about this. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how that happened, uh, but uh, you could uh, bring it up to the slideshow. Think on the slideshow. So, um, we've been doing a family of research over the last, uh, some of which is visible. Um, we've been doing uh, a bunch of research, and I think Rachel will talk a little bit about the parts of it. I'm going to focus in just on the rolling stuff for just a second. But uh, uh, starting about three or four years ago, uh, working with some folks, we sort of coined this term, the climate gap, to look at the fact that climate change has disproportionate impacts on people of color uh, and uh, low-income folks. And that has a lot to do with the social vulnerability issues that you were mentioning earlier, a lot to do with people working uh, in the agricultural sector, and a lot to do with some co-pollutant issues that will also lift up. Um, we've since gone and done mining and climate gap 
how you need to pay attention to this and basic and climate gap, which is about communities. But along the way, one of the things that we realized was that you needed to look at polling data. And there's been an interesting thing in California that the Public Policy Institute of California has does an annual a survey on Californians and the environment. And you know, since about 10 years ago, they've been finding a consistent thing, which is that Latinos care more about the environment than non-Hispanic whites in the state. Uh, and it actually surprised a lot of people who have kind of the impression that Latinos are going to be, you know, maybe more immediately concerned about jobs, etc. But literally on almost every issue, Latinos and non-Hispanic whites in California are the two largest groups, so those are the ones where the numbers are the most reliable. This is also true for African Americans and Asians, but you can have less confidence in those numbers because it's a smaller sample. Um, but what you find is that in their data, that the uh, that Latinos care more about protecting the Sierra, they care more about the coastline, they care more about protecting the air, etc., than non-Hispanic whites. And since that surprised everybody, and since I'm an academic who doesn't believe anybody else's research unless I do it myself, uh, we worked uh, with Latino decisions actually <coughs> as part of doing a, excuse me, a poll with the USC and the LA Times, in which we oversampled on Latinos to make sure that we would get a very representative sample. And what we found out, focusing specifically on climate issues, um, is do you support California's law reducing uh, emission, greenhouse gas emissions? 1990 levels. For whites in the state of California, 61%. For Latinos in California, 82%. Uh, so that's a huge difference I mean, in terms of favoring very low level of opposition on the part of Latinos, much higher opposition on the part of whites. Uh, you can also look at the following question which we asked, which was, is the state government doing enough to address global warming? At 40%, 40% of whites in the state were satisfied with what the government uh, or didn't think the government was doing enough. Nearly 60% of Latinos wanted the government to do more. And in fact, by the way, if you also phrase the question, there's going to be economic cost to doing this, Latinos are more willing to say, we need to bear the economic costs in order to deal with the environment. One last thing I want to say about this, because we did oversample and when we uh, part of what we did was make sure that, uh, and this is a Latino decisions uh, polling strategy, you know, the way most people poll Latinos is they call them, and then if they, uh, if they don't speak English, they call that in the polling world a language problem. Uh, which, by the way, no es un problema. No. So, uh, so what, what Latino decisions did is then, and we've done it in our own polling, um, is you make sure you call with bilingual uh, pollers so that you can immediately switch to the language of the person is the most comfortable in. And by the way, that isn't always doesn't mean that they can't speak um, English. It just means that they are more comfortable, particularly speaking politics um, in Spanish. The one thing, and by the way, I think other Latinos who will like this is that polls in Spanish take longer than polls in English because they're like, "Why do you speak English?" Spanish-speaking voters are more supportive of protecting the environment and more worried about climate change than their English-speaking Latino counterparts. So all the mythology that Latinos don't care is sort of exactly the opposite. And where you saw this the most dramatically was when Prop Proposition 23, which was an oil company-sponsored initiative to basically derail and not move forward with AB 32 or climate change law, the really crucial uh, part of the electorate that came out in overwhelming numbers with an overwhelming share to reject Proposition 23 and stick with AB 32 are climate change law, Latinos, African Americans, Asian Pacific Islanders. So the big message I think is that Latinos care, as do other ethnic groups, and for folks in the mainstream uh, environmental movement, who have sometimes thought that their main allies must be white, Birkenstock wearing, granola eating people who live in Santa Cruz. Uh, that, uh, that in fact, it may well be a Latino immigrant worker in Bell or Bell Gardens 
who is experiencing the taste of pollution very, very dramatically in their life, and that gets translated into being concerned about all these other issues around the environment as well. So there's a real base here to build a movement. Well, Raphael, you had first hand of this. You want to talk a little bit about Chicago and some of your some of the experiences there? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of especially the ones that are here. We noticed that Latinos are starting to engage more with the conversation of climate change, not just because we have a really brutal winter, um, but also because our summers are getting more and more hectic. Um, but also it's because our community started to see the, the disenfranchising uh, of, you know, not only our community, but other similar communities as well, because of the living industry and like coal plants and other major contributors to climate change. Uh, one of the ways we, we uh, looked at it with the Clean Power Campaign is uh, we had to go out and show our residents the true cost of having coal. You know, and that's when they really started paying attention because they're like, okay, this is affecting you know, not just only my health, but also you know, my pocketbook as well. Uh, so, for example, um, when residents have to, you know, miss a day at work because they have to go to the doctor because of respiratory illnesses or other health issues, uh, that's money that they don't have, right? That's a day that they can't afford to take off. Um, also, when their kids get sick, uh, they have to take off to take their children to the doctor. So, it's another major reason to be concerned. Uh, but also the, the long-term uh, effects of it. Uh, the way this public school system here is set up, unfortunately, uh, schools you know receive money based on attendance. So when you have you know a lot of students missing school because of like health issues, respiratory illnesses, then you know that's uh, you know uh, money that they're missing out, you know, missing work, and then funding that the school is no longer getting. So it is a double-edged sword here. Um, another way that we look at it too with Latinos is um, we're major contributors to our economy, both formal and non-formal economy. Um, and that's because we have a lot of people working outdoors. So um, a lot of Latinos, you know, not there's no farms in Little Village, but a lot of the agricultural workers are Latinos across the country, across the country. Um, and a lot of the construction workers in Little Village, you know, they're all Latinos. And they have these like really uh, uh, dangerous jobs, you know, extreme heat in the summers and the brutal winters. And, uh, extreme cold. So it is affecting uh, the, the majority of the Latino population, especially those that are working uh, outdoors. And, um, you know, when we were having this conversation yesterday about how Latinos are willing to invest more into the future, and, and they're willing to invest into green technology and greener businesses because for Latinos, it's all about longevity. Um, and if it wasn't about longevity, then we wouldn't have migrated to the United States because, you know, just my, my parents and maybe some of your family members. They came here for a better life and for a better future. They knew for their children. They knew they weren't going to like reap the benefits them themselves, but their children were. You know, and if they can see that with the green economy, and they can invest, well, then you know that's an incentive for their children. Seven generations. Um, well, uh, Dr. Moreno Flash, your research is looking at the very different kinds of climate change, and you particularly look at the heat island effect. What exactly is the heat island effect? So. Um, Heat islands are, everybody knows, for those of you who live in Chicago, those hot summer days when you're walking down the street and there's no trees around, nothing but cement, and you can literally feel the heat radiating from the buildings and from the ground. Um, and then you'll notice that if you go to a greener area of the city, a park, even by the, by the lake, you'll notice sometimes a 10 degree difference in the temperature. And that, that difference, those microclimates within a city, are what we call heat islands. Um, and we really thought to see how acute they are. The, the heat wave book that you refer to is, a, is an excellent example of, you know, people who live in neighborhoods with very little tree canopy or green um, plants, etc., in the area um, are more likely to experience uh, adverse health effects from extreme, extreme weather events. Um, those tend to be neighborhoods that have a lot of what we call impervious surface, sidewalks, uh, blacktop, buildings, etc. Um, and so we know that these heat islands really contribute a lot to those staggering mortality statistics that we see in cities when we have extreme weather events like the one that we had recently in Chicago. We had a huge heat wave in 2006 in California as well. And <coughs> heat islands literally contribute to the deaths of people um, over periods of time. And so, um, we wanted to look at uh, the relationship between race and social inequality and the risks of heat islands in America's cities. And we looked um, at over uh, 
309 metro areas across the United States. And so we wanted to ask two questions. One is, um, what's, what are the racial disparities that we see in terms of people who are living in neighborhoods where there's high heat island risks, i.e. very few trees or tree canopy and a lot of impervious surface who are going to be really vulnerable during extreme heat events. And the second question we wanted to ask is, do we see differences overall in heat island risks in cities that are in, in cities that are more segregated racially versus cities that are less segregated? So this chart kind of recaps um, the answers to those two questions. And so um, what this is looking at is um, this is looking at uh, heat island risk, which is our, a metric that we derive based on the amount of tree canopy in a neighborhood as well as impervious surface. Um, and then each of these dots here represents a racial or ethnic group as defined by the U.S. Census. So blue are whites, um, red are African Americans, green are Asian, um, and uh, purple are Latinos. And then what we looked at, we divided the metro areas by levels of segregation. So these are areas that are uh, moderately segregated, cities that are highly segregated, cities that are very highly segregated, and then cities that are extremely segregated. And so what we see are two things. One is that um, cities that are less segregated have a lot less uh, racial inequality in terms of living in neighborhoods with extreme heat risks. Okay. Not surprising because there's less uh, seg racial segregation in the very similar areas and there are even recently distributed cities. And that the inequity is really stark the more segregated that the city is. But the other take home message here is that it's overall, cities that are more racially segregated are likely to have higher heat risks for everybody. So if you look at white residents <coughs> living in very segregated cities in the United States, they are much worse off than their white counterparts that are living in uh, less segregated cities. So this also suggests the relationship between social equity policies, um, investments in cities, and city infrastructure um, that promote sort of the collective good um, that are going to be beneficial for everyone and that can probably also address at the same time the racial inequities in the I know that we're, we want to keep moving, but I do have a question. Yes. Because um, I think your, this research is so important. What, um, on the extremely segregated, Hispanics are obviously higher than other ethnic yes. groups. What, what were the findings behind that, or do you, did you dig deeper into that? How that comes to be? Well, it's going to depend on the city in, in which they in which they live. So, um, one one people might people might ask, is it because you know a lot of Latinos live in the southwestern part of the United States, where you know there's obviously it's particularly during summer there's a lot less rain and tree canopy. But we took that into account. We controlled for the fact of sort of the ecology of the region. So. Um, very often, this may also be related to the fact that you have um, immigrant enclaves and people are moving into areas that have sort of the least amount of environmental infrastructure, whether it's building quality or green space and, and those kinds of things. So we think that it's probably related to that, but it does vary city by city. Um, other research that um, Manuel and I could have done. Just add one point to what uh, we have some colleagues who wrote a paper that we wish we wrote because it's got a great title. It's called Is Environmental Just as Good for White Folks? <laughs> and basically what this data is showing is that it is, right, that the places where you've got a lot of uh, segregation and a lot of differential in terms of environmental exposure, it's actually bad for white people too. Um, and that's part of thinking about the idea that when people think that the problem can be put in someone else's backyard, or someone else's right. little village. You just wind up getting a lot more of it in the city or region as a whole. And that actually squares with the opinion data too, where what we're saying is that making these alliances will be good for everyone in the state. Yeah, I mean, I think these collective investments for the common good are really important for environmental justice, but really important for everybody. Um, and I think that in terms of thinking about policy strategies, uh, political messages, um, constituency building are, are really important. Um, this is another study that um, I worked on with people at the California Department of Public Health, where we developed.
health metrics of climate change vulnerability um, in Los Angeles County. Um, <clears throat> so this is a slightly different measure of uh, a score of climate change vulnerability. So this is low vulnerability for neighborhoods and this is high vulnerability based on a variety of metrics, which I don't want to go into too much here. But basically this is showing that you know Latinos and African Americans are disproportionately living in neighborhoods that are, would be characterized as highly vulnerable to, to climate change. And we also see, um, we see this in terms of household income, the average household income of residents who are living in highly vulnerable neighborhoods is much lower. Um, so again, this I think it's important when we're thinking about messages and policy strategies that we always keep in mind this nexus between um, social equity, environmental justice, and improving environmental quality for everybody. Which I think is a is a really important message also here, right? This idea of how do we, how do we come together? And we're gonna, when we come together, we're going to propose solutions that will do what? Or what are the solutions or strategies that we have found that would be most important to address? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start just building upon what you mentioned about, about this paper, which I agree is a great title. <laughs> is environmental justice good for, for white people? And the answer is yes. Um, I think that, that that's how we have to think of it, is that ultimately, especially when you're talking about um, cities or when you're talking about climate change, it's really helpful for all of us because uh, it's not the type of issue that uh, even if the immediate impacts of air pollution are much are felt much more strongly by the communities surrounding the area, ultimately we're all paying the price at some level, and we can all benefit from the solutions. Um, so I think that that's something really important to keep in mind. Uh, but in addition to that, for cities uniquely, and something that that I think is really exciting that NRDC is working on, is um, how can we make sure that we work in communities that are more impacted in uh, affordable housing, in low-income housing, to make sure that those green spaces are there, to make sure that the heat island effect is mitigated in a significant way, um, and to make sure that really overall the quality of life is improved, not only there, but for all. So that's one of the, the really interesting and important things. And I, I don't know if you want to add anything, Henry, I see you kind of, and we, we can open this for a conversation, but um, I know that that's something that, that's one of the policy solutions that we're very interested in looking at. Well, and, and I'd like to offer the story a little bit about uh, community participatory research and that as a tool to engage on the ground kind of data to work in conjunction with policy. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I maybe wanted to uh, talk about, though, is a little bit about why you need to think through policy in some careful ways. Um, because I do think that there's a number of things that can be done. I know that Rachel will probably talk about them in terms of uh, planting trees, uh, you know, uh, mitigation uh, and adaptation strategies as well as direct strategies. But one of the things I think to be careful with is to make sure that solutions uh, don't worsen the problem of inequity or wind up shattering the political alliances that we need to move forward. And the one example that I want to give to you um, of this is the debate that's occurred over cap and trade in California. The way in which we've implemented AB 32, which is trying to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, is the adoption of a carbon market. Uh, and in that carbon market, like other kind of carbon markets, caps are put uh, and people who can't meet the cap can actually trade and instead have somebody else reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and actually, environmental justice advocates have objected to the cap and trade uh, mechanism, and I want to give you an idea of why. Um, these are two uh, places in California that emit the same level of greenhouse gas emissions. One is the La Paloma Electric Plant near Bakersfield, and the other is the Exxon Mobil uh, Refinery that's near Torrance in the South Bay in Los Angeles. Exactly the same uh, within, you know, about I think it's 10 or 20 uh, tons of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, however, uh, the La Paloma plant emits uh, 50 tons of particulate emissions, co pollutants per year, uh, and living nearby within six miles, 600 people. The, oil refinery in Torrance emits 350 
concerns a particular matter, and 800,000 people live within six miles. Um, in a cap and trade system that just looks at greenhouse gas emissions, you know, trades between those have, you know, no, they're not considered to uh, really create any kind of problem at all because reducing greenhouse gas emissions in one place is same as reducing it in another, another place because it has sort of universal benefits. But what doesn't get taken into account is the co-pollutants. And what a lot of communities have been worried about is that the reductions are going to occur in a place like La Paloma, and you're going to wind up not mitigating the co-pollutant problem that's affecting a lot of people in a place like Torrance. Um, that was a serious objection raised to cap and trade. By the way, in our book, in our uh, report, Mining the Climate Gap, we proposed a number of things that could actually make the cap and trade system work better. For example, restricted trades from places that were already over polluted. You simply can't trade out of there. The creation of a community benefits fund, which is actually something that the state wound up taking up. Um, a number of other things that might involve differential prices so that it would be much more expensive to trade out of the refinery than to trade out of the Bakersfield power plant. But unfortunately, a lot of mainstream environmentalists were so excited that we were doing something about, cap, about greenhouse gas emissions and that we had a cap and trade system, they felt like, oh my God, tinkering with to deal with these environmental justice concerns would shipwreck the politics. But it kind of works actually the opposite way because if communities don't feel like they're being heard around the co pollutant issue, then they're not going to line up in alliance. And this turns out to be a very serious, I mean, it's a worthy issue, and the fixes on it turn, turn out not to be really that uh, big for one other reason as well. There's a thing within the environmental science literature of disproportionality. And what disproportionality means is that when you look at the distribution of pollution, it's generally like a few bad actors that are really the worst. And you could literally choose the 20 worst polluters in California in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and co pollutants, or the auto refinery industry, which is pretty uniformly bad in terms of both of those. And if you simply said no cap and trade there, you've really got to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions and you've got to reduce your co pollutants. You're talking about a very small number of firms because of the rule of disproportionality. But this conflict around that wound up really separating what was a natural alliance between mainstream environmentalists, environmental justice groups, non-Hispanic whites, Latinos, and others. And so one thing I would say is that when we're thinking about solutions, and I know that Rachel, I think, will talk more about solutions, that when we're thinking about solutions, we need to make sure that the solutions uh, really don't worsen some other part of the problem, and that they actually reflect what communities are concerned about. Maybe you want to say a word about other kinds of solutions? Or? Yeah, um, so I think, you know, we're fortunate in California that we're, we're the eighth largest economy in the world. We're actually most concerned about climate change, which is really awesome. And I think, as Manuel pointed out, by forcing these firms to reduce greenhouse gases, a lot of co pollutants are going to go down as well. So that's a huge opportunity to improve um, the public health of people who live around these facilities who've been, who've been enduring, you know, these neighbors for so long. Um, and so I think the you know the environmental justice strategies to say how do we create a system a, a, a greenhouse gas reduction tools that really make sure we get the biggest sort of public health bang for our, for our greenhouse gas reduction buck essentially um, and that cap and trade needs to take these inequity issues into concern. Um, another great strategy um, has been that you know because of greenhouse gas reduction goals and goals. It, firms are going to have to pay for something they used to be able to do for free, okay, which is great. Now that may be through cap and trade, other, uh, other uh, states who start doing stuff on climate change may choose other tools to do that, but polluters are going to have to start paying. And um, so, as my wife mentioned, uh, there's been an effort and a very a successful legislation that was passed uh, over a year and a half ago in California called uh, Community Benefits Fund, SB 535 which requires 25% of those revenues generated from cap and trade to be invested in environmental justice communities or in projects that benefit low-income communities of color in the state of California. So that's another option where we can ensure that investments in further mitigations in neighborhoods that are disproportionately impacted by these polluters are targeted in appropriate ways. 
It can invest in the greening of communities that are very high risk of um, heat islands um, and other adaptation strategies. Um, these funds can also be used to cushion low income communities of color from the disproportionate economic impacts of climate change. One of the big issues that we face uh, in California is that the costs of energy are, are, are going to go up because of climate change. If you think about the cost of running a power plant that's dependent on water and you have a drought, you know, water resources to run power plants start to go down. Power plants and power companies pass those costs onto consumers. Low income communities pay and households pay a much higher proportion of their household income to, for energy. So these kinds of community benefit funds can also be used to um, cushion from these economic impacts of climate change itself. So in terms of strategies, you know, we're really talking about <coughs> out socially, um, in terms of helping communities and neighborhoods become more resilient, like the construction, like these projects that you're talking about, the parks projects, greening projects, uh, investments in infrastructure, uh, cushioning communities um, environmentally, making sure that we're reducing co pollutants in places where they need it the most, um, and dealing with the This, the second thing that we wanted to raise is community engagement in the science and the research. Um, this is really key. This is something that we have worked really hard on. In addition to building constituencies, a lot of decision making on climate change is based on, on research. And we, we strongly advocate the importance of engaging communities in that scientific process itself. Um, and so when you do this, well, when we have done this work um, and our research on looking at climate change impacts and disproportionality in the state, we've done a lot of work that we call ground truthing, which is going on the ground in the neighborhoods that, we, that come up as disproportionately impacted and say, how accurate are these data? What are we missing? What is community-based knowledge can offer to make us as scientists know what's going on even better, and even more important, lend itself to really good solutions. So this is an example of um, the work that we've been doing. We've been doing ground truthing from our um, climate change vulnerability kind of screening work. We've done it both in Northern California and East and West Oakland, as well as many sites in Southern California. These are the reports that we produce that are available online. Um, and we've done everything from you know walking neighborhoods and marking um, uh, industries uh, that are likely to be subjected to regulation under the climate change law, um, as well as doing air quality monitoring near areas of concern. So here, uh, we were training people how to use these dust track monitors to really sort of verify uh, community concerns and, and document that as part of the record, and then really figuring out where do we want to be targeting these kinds of investments in the future. Well, the word I would add to that is that the impacts of it are both on the science so you do wind up producing a full research picture. It'd be very interesting for what we on us too. One of the things that we found is that the, the people who participate in the community-based participatory research uh, become more confident with the science that's presented to them. So we, one of the reasons why we developed this is we've developed a pretty high-tech environmental justice screening method, which is like GIS kind of crazy, you know? Uh, and uh, and we were so worried it was going to get technical and away from people that the ground truth thing was a way of verifying that the data was accurate and that people would feel some ownership over. Mm -hmm. That was our original intention. But one of the unexpected side benefits was seeing um, an immigrant mother get up in front of city council completely confident because she had done ground truth thing about the data that she was about to talk about, the fact that there really was a problem there, and the fact that policy needed to be changed. The policy that they developed and are beginning to pilot in, uh, uh, in Los Angeles, which I think might be kind of useful for Chicago, that came out of the Hidden Hazard Study, is called Clean Up and Clean Up. And it's taking three uh, definitely overexposed neighborhoods uh, and having the city target them to clean up and clean up. That is, to clean up uh, pollution that's there, uh, to take the current industries, because nobody wants the businesses to leave, and to help them green into more uh, environmentally sensitive uses, create more green space, etc. So it's really led to some real confidence in the 
part of community actors. Is that what you see as well? Yeah, definitely. And I like the word that you use with confidence because recently we just had a, a, a youth summit on climate change. So what we did was we invited uh, local high school, friendly high school, and others, uh, Southside uh, high schools, and even Southeast uh, high school to come out and bring their students and basically bring out their the garden club, their climate justice club, their overwhelming club. And so they can, so basically what those uh, posted at the Field Museum, um, and, and what we did was we brought different uh, STEM professionals, you know, and then we had the EPA there as well. And so we had the, the students present, uh, remind you these are all high school students, we had them present their work to people like the uh, USEPA and the Cook County and all that stuff. And I like the word confidence because these were high schoolers that were, you know, like talking to USEPA people and technicians mm -hmm. and saying, hey, we're doing soil sampling, like we're doing your job. Like, and that's like, you know, that's what I'm talking about. Like, it's also at the, it starts at the ground level, but also like, you know, back to the long-term relationship with the you know, community and longevity. These are potential careers that the youth could, could uh, eventually have, you know, STEM careers. And if you see the numbers, Latinos are, especially women, are really underrepresented in these fields. That's hugely important. I just want to say, especially being here at, at the Great Cities Institute, I think being able to foster that talent um, and, and all of you uh, just being here is, is really reassuring because we do need to create that pipeline of talent. We, we want this research to be done. And, and no matter what, you know, we have that interest because it's in our history or because it's in our neighbor's history or a friend. We're going to show a lot more ownership of it, and as you've shown, that's where the good policy gets made. Not only do you have true people who can speak and tell their story, and stories carry so much more weight than data, as much as we like to rely on data, when you can put them two, those two together, that's when you really have um, the attention of decision makers, because it's real. And too often, I, I work in Washington far too much, and, and too often, uh, these are just numbers on a page. There are no faces behind it. So when you have people who really own the data, who can really see themselves reflected in what they're doing, not only does it make for better policy, but it actually humanizes an issue that's too often uh, just turned into a political talking point. So I, I just think it's incredibly important to do this type of ground truth thing. And Dr. Pastor has spoken earlier on the end about the, the, the need for the coalition that's around so this kind of work. Do you want to give some final thoughts, too, about about the coalition work and that needs to be done around some of these issues? Absolutely, and I'd love uh, for all of us to be able to say something about it, but I think that, that um, ultimately, for us, coalitions are the way to, to do this. We're not going to do this alone. We're especially not going to do this as the environmental movement, um, and I think that it's that's created a, a division that's unnecessary. I think you've highlighted the opportunities of us finding ways to work together early on. Um, really, this is more about protection, about all of us protecting our future and creating a better future. And the more that we can build alliances, not only with Latinos, with African Americans, with uh, low-income communities, but the more that we can bring our voices to that conversation and not worry about, do I know the science? Am I talking about this in the right terminology? But simply telling our stories, that is where we need to be. And part of our work, bulk of our work, all of our work, truly at Voices, is to see how we can bring in that Latino leadership. And we're very proud to have people like Rafael as part of our group because that uh, youth, that young Latino voice, is, is the voice of the future, really. If we look at how many Latinos, 50,000 Latinos turn 18 every month, we are the future. You all are the future. And we need to make sure that you all are using your voices tweeting about this, talking about this, working with us, blogging about it, just telling your friends. You are leaders in your community, and that's the way that we're really going to get this done. Otherwise, um, all of the, the stories and the, the, the knowledge that you've grown up with is going to get lost in these political debates, and, and we can't have that, because ultimately we will all be hurt by it. And Dr. Pastor, we're going to look forward. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're often or you may remember the slogan from a decade ago of uh, think globally, act locally, right? I want to suggest to you that we need to reverse that a little bit, um, which is that particularly with regard to greenhouse gas emissions, it seems so far away that the, I mean, although I think you went through this last winter, I was here, by the way, during the Florida Vortex. Um, which one, the first one? <laughs> <laughs> the first one when it went down to negative 16 degrees. It was
was so cold that when I was leaving um, the airport, I was able to get in. Then when I was leaving, the plane couldn't leave because the toilets froze. It's just crazy. So I almost tweeted, man, that is some cold shit. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, that's, that's going to last forever. <laughs> Changing like that, or when you get a super storm, Sandy, Sandy, or a uh, you know Katrina, it sort of reminds us. But for a lot of people, climate change seems very, very far out there. So to me, one thing I think that's been underexploited by the environmental movement is to stress the co-pollution issue, to stress the immediate benefits, to talk about public health in a way that makes the issues feel very immediate uh, and really moves people along. So they're thinking about their kids. And, they're thinking about whether they can play outside, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, in order to act globally, we're going to need to think locally. We're going to need to figure out what the local and immediate impacts are. That means what I just talked about. It means ground truthing, doing local stuff. It means doing adaptation at a local level. Maybe Rich, you can say more about basic and climate capital stuff that we've had out, people doing at a local level and lifting up those examples. Because when people have think locally, when they start to see the immediacy in their lives, so then they're part of a broad coalition to deal with what's really a global problem. Yeah, and I think the other thing um, that I want to put forth out there is, in our Mind in the Climate Gap report, we tell the stories of a lot of communities in California, both rural and urban, they're doing really critical community-based environmental work. that. Traditional environmental organizations might not consider climate change work, but in fact it is. So whether that's tree planting and urban farming campaigns to create jobs, okay, that might not be previously been considered work of relevance to climate change, but it really is. Um, land stewardship issues on Native American lands that are really trying to anticipate how the how the landscape is going to change and how they're going to feed, feed their community. Um, trans uh, fights over transportation infrastructure and transportation access and enhancing uh, public transit infrastructure. Those fights and advocacy and activists have been, have been around for a really long time. It's just that we haven't considered them climate change activists, but in fact they are. And so I think we need to lift up that sort of legacy of fantastic global work and really say these are our climate activists right now. These communities are doing climate change. We need to harness that and we need to support it and put it up. And on that note, I have final comments about the work here in Chicago. Um, I think uh, we do have a work that Alberta will be a little bit on the south and side. Uh, for those who are not familiar uh, with the efforts going on the south and side, I, I advise you to check out the, some information about the you know, work that the Southeast Environmental Task Force is doing. Because uh, I, you know, I honestly thought we had a work that Alberta a little bit. But, you know, what's going on further south in you know, Chicago, uh, you know, the victims are going to go through. Um, but yeah, just last piece I would like to comment on, on the graph that you, you brought up uh, with the show and segregation and, and inequality. And, and Little Village is a perfect example. And why? Well, that's because well, not only are we the youngest state in the city of Chicago, but we're the, we also have the largest deficit of green space for capital, uh, which is it, it's really unfair. Well, it's environmentally, it's, it's unfair. Uh, Racially, it's unfair, and economically, it's unfair because Little Village brings in the second most amount of revenue, tax revenue, uh, in the city of Chicago behind Michigan Avenue. Um, for those who aren't you know, uh, from Chicago, I, I ask you to check out Michigan Avenue and then go check out 26th Street, and then you just let me know your thoughts. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah no, I, I just want to say that, that uh, kind of the overarching, as much as I, I bash Washington, we do have a really good opportunity now with the President's Climate Plan, and I, I encourage all of you to, to learn a little bit more about it. Um, last summer, President Obama proposed a, a plan to tackle climate that includes a lot of what we've talked about, transportation solutions, um, of course, solutions to carbon, and um, while they hopefully will take into account a lot of what you raised, uh, Ahmed. I think that it provides us the first opportunity to put a limit on the amount of pollution, carbon pollution that power plants can dump into the atmosphere. 
that would that alone, those limits on the amount that of that pollution, because right now they can dump however much carbon into the atmosphere as they want. There are no limits to that. That's fundamentally unjust for all of us. And we can put those limits on these plants. They can do this. They have the technology. If, yes, some of the dirtier plants may have to close down, but what are the amazing benefits that we can all reap from that? But in order to get the, that done, we have a big fight ahead of us. We have a big fight against an industry that doesn't want to put any limits, that doesn't want to change the way that they've been doing things, no matter how outdated it is. So I encourage everybody to learn more and get involved because it's a really critical point. If we can start to put limits on the amount of carbon that is dumped into our atmosphere, a lot, as you said, a lot of co pollutants are going to be controlled, and a lot is going to be done towards moving us forward into a clean energy future, which is really where we all need to be. We'll take at this time any comments or questions from any of you. Yes, Hi, uh, my name is Perro Paul. I work at uh, Make the Challenge, which is an organization where we uh, teach students to uh, students around Chicago to be um, more involved in uh, civics in um, their schools and in their communities. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask about uh, what's, what's the role in the, the fight uh, against climate change in um, bringing about economics justice. I read a report by the TEAB the economics of ecology and uh, biodiversity. And they talked a lot about really holding uh, companies and huge organizations accountable for their externalities. And uh, I think the economy is a very um, important idea in how our government works and how everything works around us. So how much uh, do we need to fight and really press for making economics work in a more ecological manner? I guess I have to answer that because I have a PhD in economics. Um, so I mean, I, I, the thing I, I think that um, is that we have to uh, both accept that there are some trade-offs and then look for some sweet spots. Um, so there are some trade-offs when you uh, one of the things that we try to take an honest look at is that uh, shrinking the refinery industry in California will cost jobs, and a lot of those turn out a disproportionate number of those jobs are held by the people of African Americans. So you might want to take that into account in job training and other kinds of programs, etc. So there's some costs along the way. But there's actually also some real uh, benefits. Uh, the company that in the last year has seen a stock major company rise most rapidly is Tesla, an all electric company, right? A car company. And by the way, anybody here wants to buy me a Tesla? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I think that is a good idea. Uh, I'm stuck with my Toyota uh, Prius plug in, but uh, that's the poor man's Tesla. Uh, but what we found in California is that by moving ahead rapidly on this, which is really where the world is going, that's just actually enormous economic. Um, and the, but so there's, there's potential to get ahead on the electric car industry, and I think you know you're seeing now Tesla wanting to buy a battery plant, and I think the cost of there are going to go down. We've been doing stuff on solar in uh, Los Angeles. You're seeing a lot of business potential there too. I do want to say that we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, I'm reminded of that uh, Public Enemy song, "Don't Believe the Hype," uh, which is that there's an unfortunate thing that happened when Van Jones released his book, The Green Collar Economy, uh, which unfortunately for Van was released in October 2008, um, was written before. And the way that Van Jones wrote that was about saying, oh, we've got a growing economy. Since it's growing and we're going to be doing climate change stuff, here's an opportunity to generate jobs. And what got, what was really a book about one piece of the puzzle got looked at as being the silver bullet to solve the economic crisis, right? So people began saying, oh yeah, green jobs, that's going to solve the, the crisis. And so when they look at the number of green jobs that's actually been created in the last three or four years, they say, oh, it's not that many. It didn't solve the big economic crisis. It was never supposed to, right? I mean, the information industry isn't going to solve the economic crisis. No single sector is. 
but there's tremendous opportunity there that we need to take advantage of. And but we need to be very honest about both the, the limits of that sector in terms of how big it will get, and also the fact that there will be some you know trade-offs and costs along the way. Thank you, everybody, for your uh, presentation. I have a comment and then a question. Uh, the comment is is really trying to think about in a, in a broader way how if we center the experiences of Latinos that it may give us a, a better understanding of environmental issues and environmental justice. For example, um, if we think about the entrance of U.S. corporations into Latin America and the Caribbean, it gives us an understanding of migration and immigration and forces. So by putting forth or centering Latino experiences, it gives us a much different perspective versus kind of a lot of the debates around environmental issues are very much national focused, right? They're very much about policies that can impact the nation or a particular location versus versus other regions. Um, so I'm just wondering if that's part of the struggle too, in terms of how if we if we put forth really Latino histories, we would get a much better perspective of what's really going on and how capitalism and race is involved and implicated in a lot of these issues and class and so on and so forth. The question I have though is is um, it's really about what is the other side of producing data and knowledge about Latino communities or other other people of color in terms of their health and all these health disparities? Because it seems that given the history that we've been treated as contaminations to the nation ourselves, right? We've been everybody seeing those pictures of us being sprayed down at the border, and and uh, we've been looked at as the pollutant to the country basically, and we're still treated like that. We're still deported like that, right? We're treated as really contaminating this, this cities, right? We're, we're segregated, we're, we're pushed out, we're displaced. So in terms of producing data about our health and how sick we are and how, um, and how unhealthy our communities are, it seems that the other implication is that could be used in just as much damaging ways to say, well, this is exactly why we should be doing this. So I'm wondering if maybe we can talk about the other side of producing uh, public health knowledge like that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think that uh, it's, in a lot of our work, we try to lift up also uh, aspects of community resilience that are unique to uh, communities of color, Latino communities in particular. And actually, the data show that Latinos are some of the healthiest populations in the country across a variety of health outcomes. We're talking about birth outcomes, other kinds of chronic diseases that uh, cost the economy a lot of money. Um, Latinos are probably one of the healthiest populations in the country. There's a lot of variability depending on where people live and country of origin and length of time in the U.S., et cetera. So I think that, and yet the data to, to show the, the health impacts are really, I think, also to lift up that for Latinos, health is a very resonates because people are concerned about the future, sort of thinking about the long term, as Rafael said. And so in many ways, as a political message and for you know, lifting up what is it that motivates so many, a, higher, a high proportion of Latinos who care about, care about the environment, it really is about future uh, human health and ecological health. And so that data kind of, uh, I think, lifts up to the fore you know, why this is so compelling, because people are concerned about the disproportionate impacts of hazards in their community, what it means for their kids, their future and their and their economic future of, of, of their communities. Um, but I do agree that it's really important to kind of keep that in mind that you don't want to only be pointing out to the facts and the adverse health impacts, that you also want to look at sources of resilience um, that that fortify communities and that, that those can also be, be replicated. And I think that's why I was trying to say at the end that when we're thinking about climate change activism, there are a lot of things that our communities are doing that traditionally wouldn't be considered climate change work, but that in fact is, and that people have been doing this kind of work for a really long time. You know, we think about smart growth. Latinos live the smart growth dream. I mean, you know, higher proportion taking public transit, living in more dense, you know, commute, densely populated communities, all the things that we push in terms of smart growth. So I think there's a lot more that could be sort of lifted up in that sense. And I think so. I think your comments really, really resonate. Yeah, I guess to add one footnote in the way. I mean, uh, and Rachel's really the expert on this. She has the PhD in public um, health. But one of the things that's interesting about the Latino health indicators is called the immigrant health paradox because it turns out 
Uh, that's something that's particularly true of immigrant and Latinos. And the longer you're in the United States, the sicker you get. Uh, there's something about being here, right, that and under the conditions that you're talking about, which erodes the health advantage that people have to come with. So that, that says a lot about how we need to change the structure and build on the assets of what people are bringing in terms of their own systems. No, and I just want to ask something. It is an excellent, excellent question, and it actually ties very closely to what you said in your comment. Um, you know, Gallup did a, a poll um, that looked at just climate uh, perspectives around the world, and actually Latin Americans um, came up higher than all, all of the world uh, as caring about climate change and air pollution and all of these uh, concerns environmentally. So that says a lot about us, and it says a lot about us culturally. And I don't know that anybody's really been able to define why that is, but I think that a lot of it is, is tied to those why when we arrive, we're much healthier than as we get longer. But um, I think about your concern a lot as well, because the more that we talk about this, the, we don't want Latinos to look bad at all in this, or communities of color, period, to look like they are the problem. <clears throat> but I think that actually I would point to what Rafael said as what we like to focus on. Look at how much, and exactly, you, we've all said something to this, but when you can say that, that the Latino community at 26th Street, which I'm hopefully gonna get to go visit very today, if I can, is second only to Michigan Avenue uh, in economic, for this, in economic uh, income for the city, that's huge. That says to me that we are not the problem, we are actually the solution. And when you look at buying power, it's the same thing. Latinos are the solution. If you look at, so all we're missing there is political involvement um, so that we can show that our voices aren't just complaining. We're actually proposing solutions and we are proving that, proving that out despite the challenges um, that we can do this and that we are doing this the right way. So I think it's, the burden is on us as Latinos and, and I know that I put that burden on myself to make sure that we can elevate those success stories, elevate the examples, of, as, as uh, Dr. Morella Farsh highlighted, of how communities are already leading the charge there. Um, that we, the fact that we can say that Latinos are willing to pay a little bit more, that Latinos want electric cars more than anybody, um, we get it. So let's talk about how we need everybody else to catch up with us, rather than we're the problem. No, we actually have the solutions and we're at the forefront of supporting the solutions. So hopefully everybody else will start to follow. Yeah, I'd like to add to that real quick. I know because we've had this conversation several times in the office. But I gotta agree, agree and disagree with you. Um, with the thing with buying power, to me power is something you exercise. Latinos haven't exercised it yet, so we have buying potential. That's where we really need to show the, the Latino community that we have uh, a strong, you know, group of people, strong force behind us, and we need to exercise that potential. <laughs> Whether it is out of the free market with green energy or you know, uh, hybrid cars or whatever, but you know, we need to exercise that power as well. Rosa, um, I uh, I strongly uh, Latino Cultural Center here in UIC, and last year we implemented a heritage garden. Uh, and the reason for that is to get students to see more of the connections between uh, environmental sustainability and cultural sustainability. So this whole idea of you know community uh, knowledge or traditional knowledge, I see, in my opinion, as a cultural anthropology, is, 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 is the key to really get a message or the narrative crafted in a way that is not only for outsiders, but it's also for us Latino, which is this whole idea of elevating those positive environmental uh, values that we have brought in from the homeland. And I always tell people something really that is very basic. When I arrived here in Chicago with my mother, I was a teenager, and we used to carpool, we used to hang our clothes on clotheslines outside, we used to sit on the porch uh, in the summertime, and all these practices started going away because they were not American values, right? And this is an issue that we all have to talk about. You know, what does it mean becoming right in the face of you know immigrants not being embraced because we don't have the practice. We're not we don't want to become Americans. Right? <coughs> the fact is that there is a lot of American values are not friendly to the environment anymore. So I think the conversation 
could be very powerful if we start highlighting that immigrants have a lot of positive, right? Practices that they bring from the homeland. And we have to elevate those practices so that people in the community, these are the action climate projects, right? That we can elevate more and we can encourage people to do and that we can always show to, you know, others in the country that this is a great opportunity also for the immigration debate, right? That immigrants have a lot to afford to this country, especially uh, in issues of the environment. So I don't know, I mean, I, I guess my question is, you know, in crafty, crafting messages and narrative, uh, do you have any kind of strategies to sort of like make sure that the voices of the communities and that all these assets are elevated in those messages? So, okay, a couple things is actually work on the, I run something called the Center for the Study of Green Integration at in USC. And one of the things that uh, we did a couple years ago is we did a immigrant integration scorecard uh, for the state and judging regions in the state by how well they were doing in integrating immigrants. But for the two years before that, we first did regional contribution studies to show how much immigrants were contributing to the regional economy. So I think sort of casting things in a positive term about the contribution and sort of doing the framing that makes that possible is important. We just, I think our language is sometimes important too. So we just released a report um, about uh, comprehensive reform and, you know, what people call unauthorized immigrants. We had a title of the report was uh, uh, What's at Stake for the State? Undocumented California. Immigration reform and our future together. The term has picked, been picked up, and now the California Dome is running a campaign called Undocumented Californians. It turns out one sixth of our children have at least one undocumented parent, right? Undocumented Californians have been in the state, half of them for longer than 10 years, right? And just that term, undocumented Californian, makes them part of the family in a different way than undocumented, certainly the new legal age, right? So I think. Uh, the language issues are very important. I think the other thing, and this is where I think we need to be in productive struggle uh, with allies in the mainstream environmental movement, is that when you raise issues of environmental justice, people sometimes worry that, oh my God, it'll be divisive and we're going to lose our target voter, right? That's your target voter, right? Like, and they care about environmental justice. So, you know, while I think we've sometimes worried about raising issues of race because, oh my God, we're gonna lose the Reagan Democrat. You know, like we already lost the Reagan Democrat, right? Uh, so what we really need to do is to make sure that we're capturing the new millennials. Because the new millennials, right, both the young Latinos and African Americans, Asian, but also young whites, right, who know that these are important issues. They're worried about justice. They're worried about, uh, there's a reason why they're concerned about gay marriage and older generations or not. They're really open to these messages. So I think that we can be bolder about lifting up these, these questions. And I think your point, Rosa, too, about lifting up the values you know, as a cultural anthropologist. And this is a nice thing, right, this, with this interdisciplinary focus, right, to bring forward even the cultural aspect of it and to actually articulate some of, some of those values that, that do get pushed aside. So that's, this is fantastic. Well, and I, I just want to add one thing, and it, it reminds me of something we were just talking about before uh, we came in here. Um, I think that part of why there is some division, especially among among um, the diff actually everybody really, but I'm not going to make a distinction, um, is because of the way that we've talked about environment and the the structure of the environmental movement, and it's an outdated vision. You know, this is not about an old style environmental. This is about creating a new, new voices, a new space, so that we can all bring our own vision of environment to the table. Because until it's relevant to us, and that might mean, as you said, Rosa, you know, you said on the stoop, you are an environmentalist. Your mother taught you good environmental values. Just because she didn't take you hiking in Yellowstone that one day, that doesn't mean that you don't fit. Just because you don't go birding doesn't mean that you're not part of this. You know, hey, maybe you're an environmentalist because you turn off every light, you don't let any of it go to waste. 
But then also, maybe it's because, and maybe we've seen this with Latinos, maybe you're a Latino who cares about whales. And guess what? That's great. I think that we just need to make space for those different perspectives and different voices on environment. You know, some of it's going to be environmental justice, some of it's going to be more traditional, but the fact is that all of this is about the same goal, creating healthy spaces so that we can live in, in harmony with our surroundings and hopefully um, enjoy better health as a result and better lives as a result. So whether we're talking about it as environmental justice, the truth is, is that, and you're raising this in what you're saying, it's really about moving towards a more just model of democracy and creating a, a space for all of these different voices to join that conversation, no matter how they got there. It's not about how we get there, it's about how we move forward. And that's why building those coalitions is so important and really starting to, to just talk more openly. Um, okay, well, I guess we're going to take the last two questions here. Um, go ahead, uh, Henry, and then we'll go ahead. Uh, I would just say that uh, you're totally right that we're trying to change the nature of the movement. And when we look at what we're trying to change, is change the way we have actually have a civilization. Uh, we've had a civilization because we've burned a lot of fossil fuels and a whole lot of the, ben uh, the benefits uh, don't actually track to the people who are bearing the burdens. Um, and I'd say that maybe we've got to start thinking also about this whole thing about um, uh, aliens. Who actually are the aliens? You've got Southside of Chicago where the burden is on uh, a community that's 70% uh, uh, Latino. Uh, who generates the burden? British Petroleum. They are also in, uh, they're, they're getting this oil from Canada, uh, where they're destroying uh, a, an ecosystem that's as large as Florida. Uh, I think they're probably more the difficult aliens than the people who are committed to the community. Uh, for instance, Olga Bautista, who was there, uh, was saying, we live here, this is our community, the stuff being dumped on us is coming from outside the community, in order to then be sent somewhere else where we'll be a burden to another community. Uh, so there's a, a question of how you live, how you create a community, our neighborhoods, and what our commitment to the future is. And there's a lot of language we need to change. And um, I just think it's a, a fundamental democracy, community-based, broadly integrated vision that we need to be articulating. So um, anyway, I just think that the, the nature of aliens and immigrants is, is a bad language around where we live in our communities and are transforming it for the future. I just have one final comment. I would think it's just remiss though if we don't talk about, I think from hearing from Rosa's comments that there's just the reality that undocumented folks were excluded from the Affordable Care Act also, right? So when we're talking about this issue, I mean, it's just a real thing that we got to think about. Um, as far as that policy, so even if our, if our people are great solutions to these issues, they're still being vastly, vastly looked at as expendable populations. Their health is not is not taken into regard, right? And so I think we got to be real about that and, and think about how, again, if we center Latino experiences and even potentially even center the undocumented experience, we can link those immigration struggles with environmental justice struggles, with struggles for racial and economic justice. And I think that's the potential of it. I and mean, I think we have to talk about that too. So. I just want to uh, say that this was wonderful. I, I hope that you all uh, just carry the voice forward and thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you to the Great Cities Institute. It's really great to be here. Thank you, everyone.